Hello and welcome back to the last session of the day. Uh, we're going to open this session with Matt Goff uh, coming in from MACE in London. I, uh, I had a chance to speak to Matt, I think it might have been earlier this week or late last week, and we we're talking about what his experience of COVID has been like. Turns out Matt's a bit of a music fan and he's one thing he's loved about COVID is having his guitar right up to his desk and being able to practice some tunes in between Zoom meetings. He said, in fact, he got caught out by a colleague the other day wearing his Metallica T-shirt. And I uh, go, oh, like, are you like really a fan or you just got the T-shirt? And, uh, and he then kind of proceeded to pull out the axe and play a couple of tunes to uh, prove his commitment to the band. He's actually, I was actually very jealous of this. He actually said he went to his first socially distanced uh, gig the other day. And I said, oh, what's that like? As well, everyone has to sit outside and you have to sit on a bench. Like, you're not allowed to get up and dance. And, uh, but then he rightly pointed out that even a socially distanced gig is better than no gig at all. So to talk about using technology to build back better, please welcome Matt Goff from MACE. Hey, good afternoon, Melvin. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all, albeit the way, all the way from London uh, this morning or this afternoon. Uh, I'm Matt Goff. I'm the Innovation Director for Global Construction Consultancy Company, MACE. And I'm here today to talk to you about the intersection of our hugely important and impactful industry with these emerging mega trends that this year in 2020 have been made apparent in a way that none of us were really anticipating. And I'm going to start here. Oh, hang on. I'm going to start here with learning how to use the PowerPoint. I'm going to start here, having done that, with my holiday snaps. This is the last time that some of us met in real life, November 2019. The World Engineering uh, Convention at the Melbourne Exhibition Centre. A happier time in which you could travel around the world without restriction. Where personal protective equipment was something very relevant for our sites, but not part of our daily attire. And where you could stand two metres within two metres of friends and strangers without fear for public health. But we're not here today to look backwards. Oh no, we're heading towards a vision for the future over the next 30 minutes. But to get to where we need to get to successfully, it's always important to recognize where you've came from. So I was in Melbourne to talk about the future of the construction industry as we saw it. And within that talk, we shared the concept of disruption for our industry and the anticipated acceleration of change. This slide here referenced how, learning from my own past in music, you can witness trends that result in the decimation of traditional businesses through emergent technologies and external forces. In this case, Steve Jobs, iTunes, and the digitization of music. And in that talk, we shared how, despite all the hype and promise, we were learning that digital was not about to do that for the construction industry, as it had with music and that a more significant and pressing trend that was about to accelerate change in our sector, the climate emergency, and the declaration of global nations to move to a net zero carbon position by 2050, which was about to drive significant and enduring change, and that that change was coming fast. If only we knew. Just weeks later, Australia was recording temperatures above 47 degrees and faced a sustained period of devastating bushfires. Nearly 3 billion animals were killed or displaced by the fires, and the horrifying potential of the climate crisis became increasingly and tragically evident for all to see. The climate crisis is happening now. It is impacting towns, cities, and millions of people around the world already. This United Nations graphic shows the natural disasters that have happened since the Australian bushfires of 2019. The catastrophic impact of a changing climate is accelerating. Unrest at global inequality and a lack of progress on key matters such as the climate was also already taking place. 2019 had seen a global movement driven by the kids, by Greta, the school protests against climate inaction. 2020 has seen one of the biggest protest movements in US history arise out of the pandemic, which is resonating across the world. Far more Americans now believe that discrimination is a problem than they did five years ago. The same is true of the climate emergency across the world. The belief 
and the concern around equality and a better society is following a similar path. Beliefs shape politics and politics shapes the world. So beliefs matter. This is really important. And amidst all of this, in 2020, we've all been through the biggest disruption of any of our livelihoods, the coronavirus pandemic. COVID-19 has been likened to an X-ray, exposing the fractures in the world that we've built. People have shown an enormous capacity to adapt the way they live, the way they work, the way they organize themselves. So change is possible, and it's time to build on that as an opportunity. It's time for us as an industry, and by that I mean, I don't mean uh, faceless conglomerates or companies, I mean us as individuals, to make a choice. Do we see that past 12 months as a threat or as an opportunity? Do we see the chance for significant impactful change as possible or impossible? Do we have a fixed mindset or do we have one of growth and potential? And how aspirational are we? This is a really important juxtaposition for me. I fear that our industry, the construction industry, is an industry limited by a culture of doing things better. Digitizing old, already outdated processes, relearning on every job, treating each building and project as a one-off, a prototype, a new thing, and barely complying with policy and regulation rather than recognizing it and exceeding it. But the planet and the people who live upon it demand more. <clears throat> By 2050, there'll be nearly 10 billion people on this planet. That's beyond rapid population growth. It took us 123 years to move from 1 billion to 2 billion people on planet Earth. We're about to add 3 billion in just 30 years. The future is more cities. The UN says that 70% of those 10 billion inhabitants on Earth will move to the cities. And in order to accommodate that change, we need to build an equivalent of New York City every month. That's so many buildings and infrastructure to design, construct, upgrade and maintain. As we know, the process of construction isn't great for the environment um, and contributes 37% of total global carbon emissions. Construction as a sector and all of us who work within that sector are going to have a pivotal role in whether this wonderful planet that we call home remains habitable in the next few decades. We can't get the world to restrict global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade on our own, but without us making good choices fast, nobody else can do it either. Without us, that Paris 21 target is not achievable. And without us here in this room, on this Zoom call, in this sector, the, the sector isn't going to change. It's our choice. If cement was a country, it would be the third biggest contributor of carbon emissions in the world at 8%, just behind China and the USA. Worldwide today, there's roughly 1.6 billion air conditioning units in use. That's already bad for the environment due to the energy they use and refrigerant gases. By 2050, as a result of urbanization and temperature increases, there will be more than 5 billion. That's potentially really bad for the environment because it's a vicious cycle. The more energy we use, the hotter it gets, so the more air conditioning is required, and the more energy we use, and so on and so on. And we're just going to take a quick pause there. Right? I'm with you, your engineers, you love data, science, we're geeks. These facts, they're big, they're clear, they're pretty frightening. To tackle climate change at this scale, I think we all know it's pretty clear the first change will be needed at policy level. The UK was the first major economy in the world to set a net zero emissions target in law for 2050. Australia, New Zealand, same targets. Even China has now committed to move into a net zero carbon economy by 2060. But to get there, change has to start now. So what can we do to make that happen? At MACE, we're advocating for change through all of our people. We are changing how we work, not just in the UK and not just following government guidelines and regulations, but globally, wherever we work. Our vision is to be the industry leader in shaping cities and building sustainable communities. 
Each and every day, we're asking our people to pursue a better way for construction. We're asking them to make the right choices. One of those choices is about changing what we do, industrialising all parts of the process to realise opportunity, find efficiency and do better things. We talk about moving from construction to production. We see a future where we design, manufacture, assemble and operate the built environment in a better way to deliver better outcomes. And I'm going to take you through a few examples of where that approach is helping get some serious traction. This project here is NO8, a project we started working on in 2014 and completed in 2018. It was built using a radically new technique for the UK. Our rising factories, those two big tents that you can see on top of the towers there. It was a game changer. We were delivering a floor of residential in 55 hours. It changed our mindset in terms of what we believed was possible. It won every innovation award going in the UK in 2018, and it delivered better outcomes. 30% faster, safer. We did 2 million man hours without an incident. Off-site consolidation led to 40% less vehicle movements, and we reduced waste on site by 75%. But this is just the start. In partnership with our very good friends from Melbourne, Hickory, we launched a new business in 2019 called Mace Tech, a business with a sole purpose in accelerating innovation and technology to deliver high-rise residential in a better way. <clears throat> so moving on from our factories, the next project work started on NO6. It was a follow-on project on the Olympic Park for the same client, Qatari de Yardalansi. As you start to see in the video here, we removed the need for a 600, our 600 ton steel structure tents or factories by integrating the precast floor with the facade before installation on site. And we doubled down on the standardization of our specific products and sub-assemblies. The result is that we're going even faster. The last 24 floors across the two towers at NO6 have been delivered consistently within a 50 hour time period. That's a 10% further improvement on our NO8 project. And we've got a path to get even quicker. A lot of the process and products that we're using are the same as with our rising factories. Um, you will see here a, a sequence, a traditional sequence, so installation of a lot of what is fairly standard products across the uh, industry. Um, precast core, precast uh, walls, precast columns, precast floors, facades. Uh, there's an element of wet pores still required in order to stitch the floor plate. Um, here you'll see some props coming in in order to enable the next floor. Big MEP modules, and just coming in here, utility cupboards and bathroom pods. None of these necessarily unique in terms of product, but in terms of process and how we've approached it, as I say, a real game changer for MACE. To achieve our aspirations, we are approaching these projects in a similar way to how the automotive industry would build a car. A standardized kit of parts, a standardised kit of parts with a fully integrated supply chain working to a common set of terms and standards. These are our current 15 sub-assemblies. They make up roughly 70% of the final build and we're rapidly developing solutions for that remaining 30%. I'll just draw your attention quickly to that red box where we're now integrating MEP trades with the structure. As shown here on the left-hand side of the picture, we have precast core modules, which are integrated with the horizontal MEP service modules before delivery on site. We talk about this as convergence. We're you know, engaging the supply chain in a very, very different way. These horizontal service modules provide the services for the entire floor, are plug and play, and are installed in just 15 minutes. They even have the permanent lighting installed on the on the bottom so that we can use that as our temporary site lighting during the construction period. 
On the right, again, we are working across our usual trade barriers in order to integrate our bathroom pods and utility cupboards with our pre-serviced internal walls before it hits the site. That reduces the need for 20% of the wall that is normally put in place to mask the cupboards or the, the pods. And there's an average 20% additional saving by not having to cut and fix plasterboard on site traditionally. This one's great. I imagine we've got some electricians in the room. Nothing happens off site for the Sparky. It's just a no go, can't be done. But again, borrowing from another sector, in this instance, aerospace, we've started to develop modular wiring looms. This is basic stuff, but look at the savings an 83% reduction in time on site. By cutting the cables, grouping and sleeving them off site to create a loom, fitting those looms with proprietary male and female terminal blocks to allow this sort of plug and play technology. And then on site installation, which is as simple as I'm rolling and laying out the loom, raising it in the air and clipping it to the slab. It's not rocket science, but it is approaching construction in a different way to how we do it traditionally and it's delivering great results. And it's not just MACE that it's driving benefits for, it's helping our clients to achieve better too. By incorporating our approach to standardization, the sub-assemblies, products and components we've talked about earlier, into the design process, our client Get Living has been able to rationalize the cores and common areas, improve stacking and standardize and improve layouts. They've got 9% more apartments in 9% less space in NO6 compared to NO8. And from a developer perspective, that's a pretty good impact on your bottom line. Our people at MACE are also bringing a different mindset to how we develop, adapt and deploy technology across all parts of the project lifecycle. This is driving further improvements and productivity on our NO6 projects and it's been massively helpful through COVID-19. This here is Lobster, tracking on-site progress in 15 minute intervals and giving all parties a clear picture on progress, comparable against the BIM model. One of our most popular technologies of recent times is Disperse, 360 degree image capture of the entire site, uploaded to the cloud, processed using AI, and then reported back progress on a weekly basis a godsend during COVID-19. Our site management staff continued work without needing to be on site. We conducted valuations, completed quality checks and sign-offs, and activity plans with the key trades, all online. And their technology allows us to measure performance against plan super effectively too. And lastly, from a technology perspective, another tip of the hat to Melbourne this morning, and my current faith, Wynomia is allowing us to track all of those products and sub-assemblies from the point of manufacture through to installation and QA on site. As you can see on the bottom right of the screen there, we have a number of gateways or checks that using their proprietary Bluetooth and mobile technology, we're able to pretty much automate. Pre-Wynomia, it was taking four different MACE people a combined week of effort to produce a weekly progress report that by the time it was published, was already out of date. With Wynomia, we get an update every three minutes and those people are off doing far more valuable things. Okay, I didn't want to come to BIM, MEP, OZ without talking about BIM or MEP too much. So just one more example from our construction to production uh, approach that we're taking at MACE, which is hopefully particularly appealing to the uh, pipes and wires audience here today. Uh, this is 40 Leadenhall. This is one of our newest projects, a massive 900,000 square foot office building in the city of London. That nice shiny one in the middle of the picture there. Our MEP contractor is our in-house MACE MEP business. And what MACE MEP does is within the gift of any of us here today, greater ownership of design, greater ownership of products, engagement right down through the supply chain. This very shiny plant room of chillers here on screen is our BIM model, but at Reba stage three, detailed design. It's significantly more detailed than we ever normally get. As an example, the BMS is already designed, integrated, 
and the control panels, etc., will be incorporated into our prefab plant before it's even shipped to site. The builder's work package is already done, it's designed and incorporated. All we'll need to do is the sort of action requirement on site. And the basement GAs have been drawn to suit the services strategy and not the architects. That means a more efficient design and an increase in net lettable area for our client. This cooling tower here, way more advanced in design maturity than we'd normally go. As a, and as a result, we're getting more out of the modeling process. The design model and the subcontractors models are all integrated into the same design process. And we're able to use the BIM model for a hell of a lot more. It's doing all of our quantifications. We're using the BIM for the weights and measurement, right? Our temporary works design has been done before the stage four structural design. And we're also able to use it for the index presser calcs, getting ahead of the tech subs, et cetera. And one of those magical sort of unicorns that we've been chasing for a good period of time, we're actually using it for the costing. And all of that is achieved, again, by just thinking about things differently, by taking and adapting, adopting a different mindset. So forget all those outdated processes of the past. We're industrializing the product, but we're also industrializing the process. And we're collaborating. We're working together with all parties to achieve better outcomes. And this is where construction to production is taking us as a business. We're guaranteeing better results for our clients, but not just our clients, for everyone involved. Better quality, faster, safer, and importantly, a reduction in waste, a reduction in deliveries. And by focusing on products, we're actually starting to reduce our embodied energy as well. We're doing a load of things better, contracts, process, BIM, offsite, but we're also doing better things. We're optimizing products, we're changing the game. And the question that I always ask our project teams is, and this is why they find me quite annoying at times, are we doing enough? Which takes us quickly back to the climate emergency. This slide here is taken from an ARAP report released earlier this year on how we as an industry have the opportunity to do more. The stats are that if you make a decision that reduces the carbon footprint based on a typical large office building, reduces the carbon footprint by 1%, you've saved 100 tonnes of carbon. That 1% could be anything. It could be a different material. You could optimise the structure. You could improve the energy performance. 1%. 1% is the equivalent of not taking 100 flights, of committing to 50 years of veganism, or ditching the car and walking everywhere for 33 years. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things, we probably should, but when you put it in the context of what you could achieve at work, this month, next week, tomorrow maybe, it hopefully starts to light a bit of a fire in you, in terms of the positive impact that you can have in your job, that benefits you, that benefits your kids, that benefits your grandchildren, and ever more generations. And that's going to work with purpose. This man here is Scott Baker. He's a really experienced electrical engineer currently working on one of our biggest projects, the Battersea Power Station project in London. Just tell you a very brief story about Scott. So one Saturday morning, Scott is at home and he's in his garage. He's playing around with some lights as you know, engineers may do on a weekend. And his daughter, Rose, who's nine, is, is stood there watching him and asks, Dad, those things you're using, why are they all wrapped in plastic? That's not great for the environment, is it? And as Scott sat and pondered that question later in the afternoon, he gets thinking. You see, each and every light fitting that his team had bought and installed was delivered in a box, but also wrapped in single-use plastic. On his last job, one of the biggest and supposedly greenest corporate HQs in London, they'd installed 98,000 light fittings. Scott had employed a member of staff whose job it was, was to take the box, take the light out of the box, unzip the little plastic bag, 
remove the light fitting, hand that to the installation team and dispose of the bag. What a crappy job. So that Monday morning, Scott called a few of his suppliers and he set them a challenge. Could you remove all single use plastic from our job at Battersea Power Station, which he was about to procure? He got them all in a room later that week. And the common response from his supply chain was, yeah, 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 sure, we could try, but you need to accept the risk if something turns up damaged. Scott felt that was a risk worth taking and his suppliers proved him right. He made a great choice. In 2019, last year, through Scott's action, he prevented 16 million single-use plastic bags from being generated. You see, his suppliers woke up to the fact too. So they removed all single-use plastic from everything they supply. And where it was absolutely required, like tying cables, they're now using recycled paper. And it's paid off for Scott on site too. There's no need to employ that person zipping and unzipping the bags anymore. And he hasn't had to pay to dispose half a tonne of plastic, which is a lot of wheelie bins. And his daughter, Rose, is pretty happy that she asked that question. It's an amazing story, huh? The really interesting point, it doesn't just make sense environmentally, it makes sense financially. Scott's choice saved money on the project for the client, for Mace, for our supplier, increased productivity, we reduced manual tasks. That man unzipping the bags, he did a more valuable job. We didn't have to pay to be sustainable, it paid to be sustainable. Climate evangelists like you or I have been getting knocked back for years by the money men. It costs more, you can't prove the benefits. That perception is 20 years out of date. It's not true anymore, and the money men know it. Pension funds and investors with long-term fiscal responsibility want to and are investing in sustainable projects. It's easier to attract financing if you've got clear evidence of your green credentials. And too much of the climate movement in the past was about what climate change is doing to us and not about what climate action will do for us. Taking action doesn't require austerity or scarcity. Done well, it will result in more wealth, more fairness and better jobs. And just to bring us back full circle, this here is Yvonne Chouinard, founder and CEO of one of the best sustainable conscious brands in the world, Patagonia. And here he frames a challenge that is important for us all to consider as people within the built environment. The skeptics or the naysayers say the best way to improve our environmental impact is just not to build, right? Don't build anything, you're out of a job. But thinking back to those population predictions, that rapid expected growth in urbanization and infrastructure and buildings, it's just not possible to press stop. So let's accept that, let's recognize that, but let's try to achieve a situation where we cause the least amount of harm possible. And now, is our time to do so. Quoting another climate hero of mine, Christina Figueres, the next eight to 10 years is going to determine the quality of life on our planet for the next 100 to 200 years. The human race has never had to face a set of challenges like we do right now, but together we can change it and we can start today. It's October, 2020, and the world is still in the grip of a global pandemic. Lives and livelihoods have been threatened and lost. But as some lockdowns are easing, people are emerging into a different and uncertain world with a new appetite for change. Historically, pandemics have forced society to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, it's a gateway from one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it dragging our legacy and our destructive dead ideas with us, or we can choose to walk through it lightly with optimism, hope, and a newfound belief that we can make change happen, ready to reimagine a new world and to fight for it. Reversing climate change is just not going to happen without the construction industry. It's not going to happen without our industry making better choices. Doing things better or doing better things, gradually or suddenly, possible or impossible. 
Mace was founded in pursuit of a better way. And today we ask our colleagues to continue that mission. We all have to believe in a better way, to believe that tomorrow can be better than today and that we can make it so. Let's go make that happen. Thank you. Awesome, Matt. That's fantastic. That's an incredible presentation, both uh, in terms of the incredible examples and stuff you shared about what Mace has been doing, but just the, the conviction that you delivered it with in terms of your beliefs and, in, and really, I suppose, putting that challenge out to the construction industry to lift their game. Um, I'm going to get Shannon to join us on the screen in a second with some questions that he might have. But one thing that I'd love to ask you is, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a saying at the moment that we've seen five years of digital transformation in five months. And, you know, this sudden, you know, we've been forced into making change that we might otherwise have been dragged out over years and years. You mentioned before that we kind of had this six to eight year timeline around how we make significant changes that's going to impact our lives for the next hundred years. What would you love to see accelerated in the same way? You know, if it's the adoption of technology has suddenly we've had to flip a switch and take things on that we didn't think possible. Within the construction industry, what would you like to see accelerated rapidly? Um, I would, there's a break of things, I could list 10. Um, but I think one of the most important things that we really, really need to do uh, as an industry, uh, and it's driven by kind of uh, clients really is, is start to recognize things as valuable beyond lowest cost. You know, we are really held back as an industry by um, the, uh, I guess the culture of um, driving down a price. And, and we forget so much value and positive things that we could do and achieve as an industry as a result of driving the hardest deal. Um, We've got some things happening here in the UK that are helping to kind of shine a light on that. It's been driven by the government primarily, who you know roughly make up 40% of our construction industry client base here on a, on an annual basis, um, and helping to really kind of try and shift the parameters um, because you know lowest cost is short-term gain, right? It, it it helps somebody on a deal. You might make more money at the end of a project, um, but it's a very fixed. Kind of position and it's a fixed time scale but we build things that last for 50 80 100 years right so we need those things to be good we need them to be to have a positive impact so sometimes spending a bit more up front in order to achieve a hell of a lot more during the course of that life cycle is really important and i think that's one thing it comes back to that point around where the money is going you know where the investors and the finances, et cetera, are now focusing their efforts. You know, They don't wanna pay or invest in things that are gonna have a bad environmental impact. Um, and we as an industry need to wake up to, if the money flows better into more environmentally sort of responsible and sound business practices, then let's give them a vehicle in which they can come and invest in. So that would be my kind of number one. Yeah, and I don't know if I'm, I'm, and I'm probably not as cross this as you are, but I think the whole build to rent um, model is far newer here than it is perhaps. It's much more established, I think, in the UK and Europe. And, you know, whether or not when people are, are building those types of, of kind of investments, those longer term investments, that does change their economic thinking around how much I'm willing to pay up front to reduce maintenance, reduced operating costs in the back end and whether that's been a shift of that kind of thinking. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess we are seeing a, an element of change around that, um, mainly where the large institutions get involved in the investment side of it. Um, but, you know, the, particularly in residential, um, and I guess I'd kind of lump student accommodation into the sort of build to rent market in some respects. There's still a significant swathe of the industry and projects, you know, where developers are very pointed at, I'm going to, I'm going to buy some land, I'm going to design something, I'm going to build it, and then I'm going to flip it as quickly as possible, right, in order to maximize my return. And unfortunately, those people are not as committed to 
doing a sort of positive, leaving a positive legacy as those like, you know, we have the big funds like legal and general, et cetera, who, you know, are, are recognized that they're going to keep and hold that asset for a hundred years. Um, so, yeah. you know, that, but the interesting thing in that regard is that you're now starting to see consumer demand require it. So, you know, the, the people moving in to build to rent uh, developments demand a better energy performance. They demand a positive sustainability story. They want to live somewhere that's not just a nice place to live, but that is, you know, responsible and sustainable and, and allows them to help to achieve their ambitions around having a more positive impact on the environment and you know there's nothing better than consumer choice and demand to drive change so you know there's, there's a lot of positivity um and a lot of good trends in that respect um but we as an industry really need to continue to accelerate fast in order to you know be be the service provider and create those products that allow people to achieve their own aspirations on it, I think. Awesome. Um, as I said, I love the conviction. I think we're going to throw to Shannon now, who might have a couple of questions as well. Are you there, Shannon? Yep. Yep. Here. Yep. Thanks, Simon. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, look, uh, Matt, I think that uh, presentation, as Simon touched on, was just as inspiring this time as when you were out here in Melbourne uh, last year. So thank you for being part of the forum. Um, I, my question's probably a little more focused around suppliers and manufacturers of products and components. Um, you know, when you, I know you touched on a little bit uh, on that aspect with, with, the, uh, with the lighting example and minimising the waste there. But when it comes back to th some of these, uh, you know, innovative and radical processes that you guys have been, you know, implemented on site, you know, have you been able to do that with, e with an existing range of products and components um, that that are that are available now, or have you had to sort of work with these suppliers and manufacturers to change these things? And has that been something, that, you know, somewhat as a, as a restriction that you might be able to tackle, you know, as an area for, for you know continuing continuing to advance this type of work? Uh, you know, we've heard a bit of talk today around, uh, you know, the detail of projects and you know what what does everything we're doing, like how does it, you know, uh, reference and bring the client into the conversation? You know, I guess the, the aim of the question is around just some of that sort of focus on the suppliers and manufacturers as well. Yeah, so a lot of what we're trying to do is, is very akin to the automotive sector in some respects uh, around construction to production. Um, we, we do not see value in um, us being a uh, a sort of sole provider as such, you know, us owning the supply chain. Um, you know, there's a lot of, in, of the industry is heading down a sort of more sort of volumetric modular turnkey solution type approach, uh, where it's like, well, right, we're going to set up a factory and we're going to do it all ourselves. And um, that's not where we see our sort of USP uh, in the industry, um, mainly because we're, as a business, already delivering you know, 100 live construction projects at any one time, you know, we require scale, right? We have to be able to um, to flex and deliver and, and you yeah, know, deliver a hell of a lot. You know, 100 live construction projects is a hell of a lot of factories. Um, so our approach, much like the automotive, is, you know, how do you integrate and work more closely with your supply chain so that you are developing products and systems and, you know, standardized assemblies or kits of parts together. You know, uh, Jaguar Land Rover do not necessarily design every intricate detail of a car or a dashboard or a headlamp or whatever, um, but they do set the parameters around which a supply chain is then able to sort of perform. Um, and, you know, we're building some really interesting relationships with our supply chain, you know, very different to how we would have done it previously. Um, I mean, Mace has always been uh, kind of excelled at having uh, a really great supply chain um, and, a, and a more collaborative relationship with those suppliers. Um, but there was still a very kind of what we would refer to as a tier one level relationship where, 
you know, we would bring the supplier into the project as early as possible, but we'd still have a big risk transfer at a point in time. Um, and then we would be, you know, working together to try and achieve a good outcome for the project. Um, now we're starting to, I guess, really mature is the wrong word, but we're getting into the next level of detail with our supply chain. You know, we're, we're working closely on detailed design, product design, components, the materials that are used, the mixes, the, you know, um, and we're having to develop new skills as a result. You know, we, we're not necessarily geared up to be a, a product development company or, uh, you know, to manage the technical aspects of those things as much as we're required to. Mm. Um, but it's really exciting and you can really generate some big benefits as a result. I mean, I talked about a few of them uh, this afternoon already. Um, the most important thing is, and it comes back, most of the stuff in the construction industry comes back to this, we're still a people-based industry, right? Uh, you've got to be able to work together. You've got to be able to find the right people to work with that share in your vision and aspiration uh, and are willing to test and try new things um, because it is a bit of a uh, untraveled path. Um, pioneering would be a bit of a bold word, but you know we're, we're having to test and learn things for the first time, a lot of the time. Um, and therefore you need that degree of confidence and collaboration around what it is that you're trying to do. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Simon. Mm -hmm.